take our Bibles tonight. Let's uh, begin in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. While you're turning there, I want to uh, appreciate uh, all those that have come by the, uh, the table and picked up uh, brochures and asked questions and talked. And uh, One of the brochures that I have out there, I have several about uh, BMFP, about our mission board. One track I particularly like that Dr. Burge has written is uh, How to Pray for Missionaries. Uh, he just He's done uh, an excellent job of outlining how uh, you can pray for missionaries. One of the things that I do as a, the Asian field administrator, that uh, just simply means that I help with the watch care of our BMFP missionaries, and it also includes some others as, we, as the uh, Lord gives opportunity and the need for to do so uh, throughout the uh, Asian countries. And uh, we just uh, got back the middle of uh, February from our second annual uh, Mission Possible Asian Retreat. Uh, the objective of these retreats uh, is to uh, provide some encouragement uh, to uh, the missionaries in these uh, countries to help them to stay encouraged and to stay on the field instead of uh, allowing discouragement to uh, make such an inroad that they quit, leave the field. Dr. Burge gives a statistic and, uh, and says that uh, the average stay of a missionary on the mission field is only two years. Uh, I'm quoting him. I know that sounds like it's hard to believe, but uh, as you watch it over the years, it's, it's probably not an exaggeration. Well, I'm sure it's not. I mean, I wouldn't want to imply that Dr. Burge was exaggerating, so I'm not telling the truth. But I think we all know, as, uh, as a church that's been involved in missions for any length of time, you know there have been those times. And there have been those missionaries who just said, I can't do this. I'm through. And uh, left the way. Well, we want to try to stop that. Uh, you know, there's an awful lot of money that goes into getting in a, a missionary into uh, to the mission field. A uh, language school and, and just, you know, we, uh, we got to try to help take care of that. Another thing that I do and have been doing for many years, even before I became the Asian field administrator, and I didn't call it this years ago, uh, my pastor at the time, Brother Randy Bell, our home church, Lupton Drive Baptist Church there in Chattanooga, uh, gave it this name back in the Battle Bibles. The uh, idea is the uh, collecting and uh, redistributing of used uh, Bibles, uh, study resources, uh, study Bibles. I really place emphasis on study Bibles uh, to get them into the hands of the national pastors. And of course, these are in uh, uh, areas of the world where the English is uh, uh, relatively well known and spoken, but probably the commercial language in the country. Uh, we just had some missionaries that in Liberia, West Africa, that their container just arrived there, and we had about 15 boxes of uh, books and Bibles on that container uh, back in uh, just about November or December, I think it was, a container uh, of books and Bibles uh, reached uh, India, and we had about uh, about 30 boxes of uh, books and Bibles uh, specifically for three different Bible colleges in India. And so that's what we're trying to do, provide some resources, some and uh, not only, yes, for missionaries and their work and efforts of uh, Bible Institute, Brother Sangler, uh, he's, uh, we've provided him with some uh, materials before. We were talking about it today and making plans for some of the future uh, there in uh, the Bahamas and uh, just uh, to help equip the, nation, the next generation or this generation of uh, national believers, uh, preachers, uh, because uh, uh, sadly it looks like that we in the United States are following the same path that England followed a hundred years ago. And so, uh, you know, where, where's going to be the place that's going to be sending out the next uh, generation of missionaries around the world? And there's a few places 
uh, in the world that some of that's beginning to happen right now, Philippines uh, being one of them uh, particularly. So uh, pick up one of those brochures and uh, if we can help you with that. Y'all want, hey, by the way, I mean, if you wanted to make a collection here, uh, I, I feel pretty sure I haven't made any calls yet, but I'm pretty sure there's some Asian stores, Asian grocery stores or something, Asian restaurants, uh, somewhere in the area, well, they get their supplies uh, uh, via a Filipino shipping company, and those ships come and go, and so if they bring uh, Asian food here, they can take Bibles back there. And so if we want, to, if that might be something, I know I didn't bring my truck uh, to haul anything back that uh, we, we might have collected this week, but uh, that's, uh, uh, you know, hey, uh, the Word of God, God has promised that His Word will not return to Him void. It will accomplish. And I, we never know, you know, whose hands a copy of the Scriptures uh, might fall into and uh, how the power of that Word, <laughs> well, the promise is it'll reach all the way into eternity, one way or another. All right, I want to read a scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And ladies, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that uh, special uh, tonight. I uh, just uh, gave this preacher uh, some confirmation uh, that I'm uh, on track with uh, what uh, I believe God wants us to look at tonight. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 8. And um, let's see, let's just read verse number one. Moreover, brethren, we do you the will of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Reckon there's been any grace that's been bestowed on the grace of Calvary in Baptist Church? <laughs> oh, I think there has. Amen. I think there's some grace that's been poured out uh, this week. Uh, this is all about God's work. He said, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy, now watch this, and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. That sounds like Mary that we talked about last night, isn't it? Uh, she had that alabaster box of ointment. Uh, she probably never dreamed that, that that's what she could give. But whenever it came clear to her that that's what she was to give, and she was to bring glory to the, her Savior. Uh, she, was, she didn't think about it twice, but she obeyed. Verse number three. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, uh, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. You see what was, what's happening here. There's, uh, there's been the promise of an offering and they're, they're following up on their promise. They made the promise. They didn't know how in the world they were going to do it. But, uh, but there was something uh, stirring in their spirits that motivated them uh, to make that promise. Uh, and this they did, verse number 5, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord. They got their priorities right. They examined uh, their motives. <laughs> uh, Wednesday night's message. And uh, so now they're following up. Unto the Lord and unto us, by the will of God. <laughs> You know, it's easy to give yourself to one another when you're of one mind and one accord and <laughs> one fellowship, one Savior, one God, one Father, uh, you know, one vision, uh, one commission. Uh, verse number six, insomuch that we desired that Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you this same grace also. 
You see, they, they, uh, Titus's job was to take them to finishing school. Uh, grace finishing school. <laughs> Is, uh, are you having any, any of that finishing uh, work that grace does? Oh, yes, we are. Verse number 7, Therefore, um, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance, in knowledge and in all diligence, and in your love to us, See that ye abound in this grace also. Verse number 8. I speak not by commandment, but by the occasion of the forwardness of others. Now watch this phrase. And to prove the sincerity of your love. Now uh, turn with me to John chapter 13. I want to talk tonight about the uh, most essential ingredient. The most essential ingredient. Now, here we're using another superlative. The most. Uh, We have to be careful when we use superlatives. You know, the greatest, (laughs) the most beautiful, But you see, whenever we use superlatives relative to God, (laughs) there's not a superlative big enough to encompass Him. So whenever we're talking about His love, we we dare use nothing less than a superlative. Uh, John chapter 13, verses uh, 34 and 35, Jesus said, A new commandment, I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you that ye also love one another as I have loved you. Verse 35, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples Uh, If you have love, one to another. Now let's uh, go to the Lord in a word of prayer, please. Father, we love you. We just thank you for the opportunity and the occasion of this uh, uh, mission uh, conference, this meeting. Thank you for each one of the uh, missionaries that have been able to be here and been able to share their, their heart, their burden, their vision, Uh, for the people to whom you have called them. Uh, Thank you, Lord, for this uh, great church. Uh, Her legacy of of a vision uh, for missions and missionaries. Uh, Lord, their promise and their commitment in giving and in praying and uh, now even as well going. Lord, thank you for Erica being with us tonight and sharing uh, what you've done, what you're doing, and how the, you're guiding her and leading her. Lord, may, uh, Lord, you just uh, continue to work and supply her every need, raising that monthly support, uh, establishing that prayer foundation. Uh, Lord, those laborers together with her, uh, that, Lord, we can, uh, we can get the job done and we can finish the course Till Jesus comes. Now help us. Help us, Lord, tonight as we think about this thing of love. Your love. Uh, Lord, with the, with the uh, thing in mind of, our, of the sincerity of our love being put to the test. Uh, yes, this week, and yes, in the uh, context of faith promise giving. But Lord, every moment of the day, day by day, in all of our connections and all of our relationships, Lord, we just pray that when this service is over and uh, the lights are turned out and we've gone home, that Lord, we've, uh, we'll have a, a greater understanding, a greater conviction a, uh, a greater, uh, Lord, being more greatly consumed 
by you and your love, willing and ready for that love to just flow through us like an ocean. Have thine own way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, this is the most essential ingredient from every, for every area of our lives. Uh, I've talked about it already this week. It's, it's the most essential ingredient in our marriages. It's the most essential ingredient in our homes. The greatest gift that we as parents can give our children, especially we as dads, can give our children is to, uh, for our children to know that mama and daddy are head over heels in love with each other. Uh, the most essential ingredient in this church is love. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. It's the most essential ingredient on the mission field. Uh, Brother Jonathan Lyons, the uh, vice president and the uh, European and African administrator with BMFP. I knew Jonathan uh, when we were serving in the military church in Spain in the early 80s. He was just a teenager. Uh, then I knew his daddy, uh, J.T. Lyons, uh, served initially 17 years in Liberia as a missionary. And then whenever Spain opened up, he uh, went to Spain in his 50s, late 50s, trying to learn Spanish <laughs> as a, a man of that age. Learning another language is not easy regardless of the age. But when, the older you get, the more difficult it becomes. So he was there in Spain uh, in the area where we were with the uh, Torjon Baptist Church and, and working with the uh, U.S. military there at Torjon Air Base. And uh, uh, most, uh, a lot of, I don't say most, but many of his uh, Spanish uh, church members uh, were people who, uh, Spaniards that worked on base and knew English uh, relatively well. Well, about once a month, Brother Lyons on Sunday night would bring his congregation. He, there was uh, 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 one of the main things he wanted them to see was to kind of get an idea of something of how a church can be put together, how a church can be run in Spain. And so they came. So one night they were there, and one of the fellows after the service uh, uh, Paco, he was, we were standing back at the bar and having some conversation, and I said, uh, Brother Paco, uh, how is Brother Lyons doing with his language, his ability in, in, in Spanish? And uh, this uh, Spanish brother kind of lowered his head, and, and uh, he said, Pastor to Russia, uh, sometimes we can hardly understand what he's trying to say. And then he said this, and I've never forgotten it. He said, but we know he loves us. Amen. Regardless of what we as missionaries or anywhere as far as that's concerned, that we might feel what our limitations are and, and what our hindrances are, if we will let the love of God uh, uh, boil up in our hearts and in our souls for others like God loves them, it'll get through It'll communicate, and God will use us. The greatest commandment is love. The lawyer came to Jesus and said, uh, Good master, what is the great commandment in the law? Jesus uh, said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. He said, I know you didn't ask me, but this is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Sin is a threat to love. Matthew 24, 12, talking about the last days. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. The closer we get to the second coming of Christ, the more attention we need to give and make sure that our hearts are hot with the love of God. The first indictment, and this is not something that's unique to our generation, but the first indictment against the church was relative to, to, to love. Revelation chapter 2, Jesus said, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. 
In 1 Corinthians 13, 13, the Bible teaches us very clearly that the greatest of all the graces is love. And now, abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is love. We're never going to lose nothing by loving. <laughs> uh, let's get to the outline. First of all, this is a command, not merely a suggestion. This is not just some uh, good humanistic self-help idea. Now, it's a wonderful thing. I mean, it'll, it'll help you. Everybody needs to be loved. But God's love is more than just uh, some good uh, uh, self-help idea. Number two, love is to be demonstrated, uh, not just defined. Now, we're, we're going we're gonna to take some time talking about it and analyzing it and defining it. But we need to understand uh, that uh, what we're talking about uh, needs to get in shoe leather. It needs to get out in the street. It needs to get into the warp and woof of our homes. It's got to be demonstrated. Jesus tells us here that this is the test of true discipleship. By the way, are you a disciple? I didn't ask you if you was a Christian. I asked you if you was a disciple. I'm not sure we know whether or not we are. Ah, we'd like to believe that we are. The word disciple is used some 273 times in the Bible. The word Christian is used only three times. And all three times it's used in reference to persecution and suffering. The first time it is used is in Acts chapter 11, verse 20, number, uh, number 26, where the, the phrase, we have the sentence, and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Uh, these were disciples. I can, you can kind of picture it, can't you? I mean, their, their number's growing, and, you know, they probably got together one day, and, you know, well, we're getting to be quite a, Number of us here, you, we, we, we ought to probably uh, think about what to call ourselves. <laughs> that was the furthest thought from their minds. They were not preoccupied with <laughs> who they thought they, uh, about themselves. They were preoccupied about what they thought about who Jesus was. The word disciple is the, is the concept of a learner. And, and, and in this context, not just an ordinary learner, but a learner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, as the Apostle Paul said in Galatians or Philippians chapter 3, that I may know Him. All of the apostle's life was consumed with his relationship and his walk and his knowledge with Jesus Christ. Every assessment, every evaluation that counted in the apostle Paul's life was the assessment and the evaluation that Jesus Christ was making of him. All of, the, all of the adjustments, all of the corrections, all of the rebukes were in the framework and in the context of what Jesus was administering to the Apostle Paul. The first time we have the giving of the Great, of the great Commission, Matthew 28. I go ye therefore, in our King James Version it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. 
That word teach is the word from which we get our, uh, the, in, the, in the verb form, it's uh, that we get our, our, our noun for disciple. The, the noun is mathetes, the verb is mathetuo. Uh, make our French Bible. Uh, it, it, it says that in the French Bible. Fait les disciples de toutes les nations. Had enjoyed getting to speak a little bit of French before the service tonight. Kind of got the juices running again. <laughs> uh, but uh, making disciples. Now this, now, now you see, our text here and our, our thought tonight is in reference to people who are taking serious this thing of the quality and the character of their discipleship relationship to Jesus Christ. By this shall all men know that ye are my mind. I mean, this, this, is a, this is a distinction. This is a designation that ye are my disciples. What was it that they said about them? They took knowledge of them, of those disciples, that what? They had been with Jesus. It was a great, great day of revelation to me as a, as a younger pastor when I came to realize that in my relationship as a pastor to the church uh, and to the people of, of the area where I lived that my first and number one responsibility was to help them to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. You're not going to help, you're not going to be of no more value to some other soul than that. That reaches into eternity. The second was when I came to realize <laughs> that my job as a pastor was to help these people, these new believers, to come into a living personal relationship with Jesus Christ where that they are walking with Him day by day, moment by moment under His Lordship. And boy, whenever people can begin to live in the experience and the reality and the beauty <laughs> of that, just turn them loose. <laughs> They'll be all right. Well, I kind of got off on a rabbit trail. I'm sorry. Oh, my soul. God help me. Uh, uh, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love, one is, this has got to be demonstrated. Uh, by the way, Jesus gives this outside watching world the invitation to look at me and you and make a decision about whether or not we are his disciples by what they're able to see exhibited and demonstrated among us. That's what I was talking about when in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8 that I read there. To prove the sincerity of your love. Now watch it. Listen to this. Everyone, in the context of what I was talking about Wednesday night, is motivated by and demonstrates their love. <laughs> but the problem is that most of the love is selfish love instead of unselfish love. Uh, Paul talked about uh, the last days. For men shall be what? Lovers of their own selves. He uh, talked about also uh, for the love of money is the root of all evil. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John 2.15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Uh, Paul in 2 Timothy uh, referenced uh, Demas, uh, one of the former followers, said he has forsaken me having loved this present world. 
But then there's that unselfish love that is expressed by the Apostle Paul when he said in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us. When the love of Christ <laughs> is a working and alive, boy, there's a compulsion. There's a, there's a motivation. <laughs> ah, I mean, it's like a mo locomotive. There's, there's, I mean, it, it, there's some things going to have to move. When that unselfish love works. All right, let's come to number three. I want to talk about love analyzed. Let's, let's think about it. Let's, uh, let's uh, kind of delve into this and think about the love of God. First of all, God's love loves the unlovely. Think of the most wicked person in the world. That is, if you can get beyond yourself. I was preaching years ago, I was preaching this message in a church down in the, back in the hills in, in Virginia, down there in the mountains. And I, I got to this point, <laughs> and uh, I got to talking about the, how I came to realize that God loved me. As a nine-year-old boy, you know, and uh, uh, you, and I and I asked the question. I said, "Now, how much how much sin can a nine-year-old boy commit?" <laughs> I, I don't, there was some nine-year-old boy, I guess, <laughs> there in the congregation. I hesitated for a, just a second, and he popped up and he said, "A lot." <laughs> That's right. Whenever the blessed Holy Spirit of God convicts you that you are a sinner, you can't see anybody that's any worse than you are. Uh, the Judah, when Judas Iscariot came to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, intent on uh, kissing him in order to betray him, to those that were coming to arrest him, Jesus addressed Judas and said, Friend, wow. As he hung on Calvary's cross, uh, just before he said, It is finished, he uttered a prayer to the Father and he said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Mm -mm -mm. Think about it just a minute. Is there anyone that God does not love? Oh, we've got those two wonderful promises in our New Testament. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved. <laughs> Again, I wasn't but nine years old. But whenever the blessed Holy Spirit of God made me see God's love for me, it overwhelmed me. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't say that's not, that's not possible. Romans 5, 8, we use it in our soul winning, helping people to uh, see the love of God. But God commendeth His love toward us. <laughs> in that while we were so pretty and dressed up and nice, in that while we were yet sinners, First, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, the Bible says that... Uh, that God made Jesus sin, the infinitely holy Son of God. He became the infinite sin. Amen. I, my mind, I, my, I, can't, I can't get a hold of that. I, I, that, that, that's, 
Uh, that's, that's Holy Spirit's taught stuff. God's love loves the unlovely. Now let's ask ourselves something tonight. As we're, we're thinking about proving the sincerity of our love. Is there anyone you do not love? Why? It gets, pro- it, gets, it gets proven. It gets tested, doesn't it? Sometimes right in our marriages. Sometimes in the parent-child relationship. I'm sure Pastor Alquist can, can, can uh, verify what I'm about to say, but in, in counseling, uh, in marriages, in counseling with people, the, the, uh, the thing that most people have a hang-up uh, with are the hurts and the anger that they have toward their parents. God's love, love I got, let me hurry. God's love loves the unlovely. Number two, God's love takes the initiative in loving. Let me ask you this question. If God had waited until we loved Him before He loved us, would He have ever loved us? You're shaking your hands. Absolutely not. Uh, no exclamation point. The Bible says, 1 John 4, 10, Herein is love. <laughs> Woo! Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Verse 19, We love Him because He first loved us. Us. Can't you just see it? Adam said, uh, Eve, I think we've messed up. We better, go, we better go see if we can find God and see if we can't get, to make this, get this fixed up. No, that ain't what happened, is it? They went hiding and uh, trying to cover themselves up and by their own human effort. <laughs> but it was God who took the initiative. <laughs> Come in at the regular time. Adam wasn't there. God said, Adam! <laughs> Where are you? God wasn't asking for information. He who is omniscient knew exactly where Adam was and he knows exactly where you and I are. He was helping Adam to see where Adam was. Oh, what a gracious God we have to help us to come face to face with our sin. I mean, that's his love. So that that love can lead us on to his forgiveness through Jesus Christ. God's love takes the initiative in love. Hey, who do you know? Who in your sphere of influence and relationship do you need to take a step toward and reaching out to them in love? Ah, a lot of places in the world where the missionaries go, their people are not wanting them there. The government authorities don't want them there. What's the missionary to do? (laughs) Brother, if 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 the love of God is not loving the unlovely in and through them and taking the initiative in loving, they're not going to make it. Number three, God's love loves. Now, this just keeps getting deeper. God's love loves even if that love isn't returned. Who does God love? There's not anybody God doesn't love. But how many are returning that love to God? 
Most people are angry at God because he does love them. I didn't ask you to love me. Has God said, all right, I'll just stop loving you then. <laughs> Blows my mind. If it was me, I would. I think probably sometimes we have to battle against that, don't we? I remember I had a, had a young couple in our church when we were at Yakota Air Base, Yakota Baptist Church. They were getting ready to PCS. Now that means a change of duty station. They were going to be rotating out. And, uh, and she sat in there at my office, and boys, they, they were just crying because they were having to leave. It, it, it just, you know, God had just worked so wonderfully in their life. They had gotten involved. I mean, in the Awanas and Sunday school in the choir. <laughs> they just, I mean, they just jumped in, you know, lock, stock, and barrel. And she said, Oh, Pastor, uh, this is so hard. I'm not going to get as involved in the next church as I did here. I said, you do and I hear about and I'll come wear you out. I said, when did we, where did we get the idea that we thought it wasn't going to hurt to love? God's love loves even if that love isn't returned, then God's love loves. We're, we're going deeper. Even when that love is, and I mean, this, is, this gets hard. This, this gets hard. Is abused and blasphemed. We were talking at dinner tonight about a new, uh, um, uh, what do they call it, in prime time television, a new program, a, a sitcom that's, that's being advertised that's, in the new series, whatever that's coming on, uh, and, and, if, and if it's anything like what they're, how they're advertising it, it's nothing but blasphemy against God, against the Lord Jesus Christ, and against the blessed Word of God. Makes my blood boil. But then I have to remember... God loves those people. And they ain't got enough sense to know it, to see it. I, I want how, how has our culture, how has our generation degenerated to such depths of perversion and corruption and blasphemy? Well, I... I just wonder if a lot of it doesn't have to fall at our feet, church. I'm just, and, and please, I don't want to put us on a guilt trip as such. But if we are guilty, we need to own that guilt. We need to confess our sins. We need to get some things right with God. And we need to start being the Christians, the disciples that God wants us to be. Among ourselves. Now, please don't misunderstand me. If you're in, a, in an abusive situation, get out of it. You, I mean, get out of it. If you know somebody that's, that's in an abusive situation, help get them out of it, get them away from it. I mean, it's right. You, it's, it's not right that they stay in. I mean, your heart my, and, and our hearts break when those kinds of situations happen. But God has made provision in our civil relationships and civil government for our protection. <clears throat> now, I've got a, yeah, let me try to, <clears throat> um, yeah, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to carry this thought through. Is there anything? that anyone can do to you that can stop you from loving them. I was challenged by that question as a parent. 
And this outline is somewhat is, is born out of this, of this experience. Uh, we were getting ready to go to Japan. Our, uh, our, we were only going to take our, our number five uh, child with us to Japan. He was in the seventh grade at the time. Uh, his next oldest brother was uh, graduating from high school that year and going to be starting uh, uh, college. And uh, so we were uh, getting uh, close to that time of leaving and we were having our family devotions with all, all of the children. The two older ones hadn't gotten married yet. They were going to be shortly and so I was, we were in, a, in our family devotions and I was trying to uh, really uh, emphasize and impact their hearts, their minds, their spirits with the value and the importance of doing the will of God in their lives. And we had some discussion and whatever and finally about 11 o'clock we had prayer and, and we started getting ready to go to bed, you know, and the kids getting their teeth brushed, going to the bathroom and things. And uh, directly that number four son, graduating from high school, uh, came back down the hallway, met me there in the doorway of the kitchen, and he said, uh, he had this little sneaky grin on his face, so uh, I knew he was up to something anyway. He said, Dad, I want to ask you something. He said, if I never become a missionary, are you still going to love me? Boy, that hit me. He had that little grin on his face, but that hit me like a ton of bricks. Had, had, I, had I somehow or another communicated to my son that there was something that he could do or not do that would, would cause me to stop loving him? And I looked him right square in the eyeball. I said, boy, let me tell you something. There's not anything you have done or can do or not do that's ever going to stop me from loving you. That little grin got a little bigger and he said, I thought so, just wanted to make sure. <laughs> well, <laughs> he put me to the test on it. Several years. I mean, we'd, we'd spent our time in Japan and a lot of, lot of stuff had happened. He had gotten married to a lady, woman, wasn't anything near a lady. Uh, had a, she, they had a child. They got divorced. Uh, they were back there at the house, you know, after we moved back here to Georgia. Uh, you know, years have passed. And we got to talking about that. Uh, one of the things I praise the Lord for, that the line of communication has always been open between me and my children. They haven't always. They've made some dumb choices. He, uh, we got to talking about this, and uh, he, he said, Boy, Dad, I put you to the test on that, didn't I? I said, Yeah, son, you sure have. But I said, The more important question is, Son, am I passing the test? <laughs> he said, oh, Dad. Big old tears came up in his eyes. He said, Dad, you passed every test I could have ever put you through. Hey, folks, that's what, that's, is, is, that's what it's got to be about. We need to tell each other uh, regularly, I love you. I tell my boys and my daughters, my, my grandchildren, and uh, my, now man, my great-grandchildren, they're getting over their talk. My little great-grandson, they got all this technology. You know, I mean, we're right there looking on this, on, I don't know, some kind of app that you got. You know, I mean, I can see him. He can see me. You no, know, he's just talking. And, and I say, uh, Matthew, I love you. <laughs> Papa, I love you. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> My boys call me, we're talking what different things. Son, I love you. Dad, I love you. Oh, listen. You know, my pastor, I, 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 Brother Bell, I, you, Brother Alquist knows Brother Bill, Bell. He came to our church uh, over 20, 20 years ago. I mean, we had just come through turmoil. I mean, the church was a mess. 
Brother Bell, I don't know whether he did it in the previous pastorates or not, but he would have a stand up, you know, when we'd read the, uh, he'd read the scripture, you know, and then he'd have a word of prayer and he'd have the people stand down. He'd say, now turn to your friend or loved one next to you there and say, I love you. I was there the first time he did it. Boy, I'm in a... Everybody got this calf in the new, looking at the new gate, looking at everybody, you know. But they, I love you. But over time, man, I mean now, we've got another pastor now. He, he's, he's carrying it on. Uh, but, you know, I mean that, because if he doesn't, people are going to turn to each other and say, I love you anyway. Uh, let me, uh, let me just mention this. I've got to stop. God's love, God's love, this is, I guess, I think the fifth point of this love defined. God's love acts in the best interest of its object. This is, this is what chastisement is all about. The parent that withholds discipline from the child, the book of Proverbs says, that parent doesn't love that child. Uh, the Bible teaches us in, in Hebrews chapter 12 that God chastens His children that He loves. But if you're without chastisement, you ain't His youngin'. Sometimes this love has to get tough, doesn't it? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop. Uh, the love of God. I reckon anybody in, in uh, you know, whenever we as missionaries, I know I've had this practice for years. I go to every, every mission conference I go to. I, it's such a joy to get to meet the other missionaries. I get to feel their heart and their burden and their vision. And I pray for them, uh, especially during that meeting, if not afterwards. Uh, and, and I pray for those local churches. I pray for those pastors. I spent some time on the phone today uh, talking to a couple of pastors about some things. And, and one of them is a supporting church pastor. A new pastor just come to a new church. Uh, hey, there's struggles. There's battles. People need to be loved. Amen. <laughs> you know, what, what? You know the people you work with at school. Maybe you've got family members. They think that some of the stuff you do is so dumb. But you know what? Who, you know who they're going to be coming to whenever the whenever it starts, whenever it's, life starts getting tough for them. Yeah, they're going to be coming to you. We want to be there. We want to have that credibility, Amen. And I'm persuaded that there's nothing like the love of God that builds our credibility. As a local church in a community, why shouldn't Erie, Pennsylvania know a Grace of Calvary Baptist Church as the church that loves people, that loves one another, <laughs> that loves a lost world that's dying and going to hell without Christ? Amen. Let's stand together. You've been so good and so kind. I. Uh, I feel like sometimes my preaching is hard as everything to follow, but you've been so attentive, so gracious, so kind. Father, Lord, uh, we start talking about your love. Oh, it's bigger than our little old finite minds can even begin to scratch the surface on. We just thank you for the blessed Holy Spirit who is our teacher. And who is our guide? And who <laughs> sheds abroad in our hearts that love that transcends all 
loves. Lord, perhaps there's somebody here tonight that's never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. I pray that somehow, Father, they can, that by the Holy Spirit they can see uh, how much you love them. Uh, and that tonight, Lord, they will receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. Lord, maybe there's others of us. Lord, I, this thing challenges me. Lord, this thing challenges me. Lord, I feel like I felt so much in practicing and demonstrating your love. Lord, it seems like it's so easy for me to get angry, Lord, to get disturbed and to have those feelings of vengeance toward people that have such hatred for you and, uh, Lord, who are seeking to undermine everything that is so precious and, and, and valuable to us as Christians. Lord, help us. Help us to pray for these people. Lord, to intercede to you in their behalf that, Lord, you will bring across their paths Holy Spirit-filled believers to demonstrate your love intimately and personally to these dear people that you love. Have thine own way, Father. Help us. Lord, we're going out soul winning tomorrow. Lord, fill our hearts for our, the love, with your love for Erie, Pennsylvania. Not as, just as a city collectively, but for every individual behind every door. Thank you, Father, for what you've done, what you're doing, what you're going to do. Have thine own way in this invitation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Pastor, come please. Please turn to number 515 in your hymn book. And as we sing this hymn, if God's spoken to your heart, why don't you come pray? If you've never trusted Christ as your personal Savior, I want to meet you. I want to introduce you to somebody named Jesus. If you'd like to know more about going to heaven, how you can know for absolutely sure you're going to heaven when you die, I'd like to meet you at the front and we'll have somebody show you that. Five or ten minutes you can know. You know, John 3.16 said, For God so loved the world that he what? He what? He gave. That's what Faith Promise Missions is about. Loving the world and being willing to give so that they can hear the gospel. God's spoken to your heart tonight. Why don't you come? If you have questions about salvation, I'll be glad to talk to you about it. As you come. As you say. Give me near the cross, there a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain. In the in the cross be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river
Well, it kind of reminded me of our banner there, loving the unlovable, Amen. touching the untouchable, and reaching the unreachable. Amen. That's what we're supposed to be doing all around the world, starting first in Jerusalem and going out from there. So I hope you'll get involved in sharing the gospel with somebody all the time. And then I hope you'll get involved in making sure others can go where you don't and where you can't. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for this message on love. We thank you, Lord, that there is love to preach about. That because you are love, there is love. And Father, we thank you that you have demonstrated your love. You have given your only begotten Son because you loved. And then in return, we're able to love you. And Father, I just pray you'd help us to take the lessons we've heard tonight, put them into practice in our lives, that your Holy Spirit would make them part of us, and that, Lord, you would love others through us, and that, Father, we might show the love of Christ to those around us. We might be the only Jesus anybody ever sees. And, Father, help, help us to be a good representative, a good example. Paul told Timothy, be thou an example of the believer. Help us to do that. We love you, Father. We thank you and praise you and ask that you'd guide and direct as we go home. Keep us safe. Uh, give us a great day tomorrow. And, Father, may you be glorified in it all. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.